Good morning. Uh, this is the Reverend Susan Byrne uh, from St. George Episcopal Church in San Antonio. I am bringing you the third installment of the Introduction to the New Testament class, and this particular one will talk about the Gospel of Matthew. So let's get started. Who was Matthew? Well, he was a tax collector. He worked for the Roman government, and this made him a traitor to many Jews. Now, the reason for this is that the Romans were um, in power over the Jewish people at the time, and the Jews, of course, resented that. Um, it was also that the actual job of tax collector um, was a bit of a, a corrupt position for most people. Uh, they were given a certain quota to meet in terms of how much money to collect and give to the government. And then once that quota was met, anything they collected above and beyond that, they took home to them for themselves. And so a lot of tax collectors would really press money out of people and in a uh, not so happy way, so to speak. So uh, most most Jews thought any kind of any other Jewish person that was a tax collector for the Roman government was a traitor. Matthew is also called Levi in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke. Matthew, uh, the name means gift of God, and we know that he was the son of Alphaeus. The Gospel. So the Gospel of Matthew is a very orderly and structured Gospel, as you'll see from the outline that I'll show you in a few minutes. It is the first book of the New Testament, and the structure of the book makes it a good teaching tool. Um, the presentation of themes made it appeal to early readers, and it is probably the book that was dominantly used for teaching new converts in the early church, and that's why it was the first book, or is the first book in the New Testament. Um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you remember from a previous lesson, Mark was probably written first, and Matthew used a lot of Mark, and so if it was in chrono chronological order, Mark would be first. So Matthew is first because of its structure, its orderliness, and also it, it really uh, conveys the whole story of Jesus' life. Uh, and the focus, kind of the theme of Matthew's book, the, uh, the way he presented Jesus was Jesus is the king. The gospel was written to a few audiences. Um, the, it was definitely written to a Jewish audience. Matthew quotes more of the Old Testament than any other author. Um, he's got a lot of Old Testament um, scripture references in his, in his gospel. He also wrote to the Christian community. The book was really well suited and structured, as I said, for teaching new converts. And then we also think that he wrote to people outside Judaism and Christianity. In other words, he emphasized that Jesus is for everyone. If you'll, if you'll note at the very end of his gospel, after Jesus is risen again, Jesus comes and gives the disciples the authority to preach the gospel to all the nations. And so it is uh, for the entire world. So we have the structure of the gospel itself uh, is focused around the five discourses. So we have a prologue that's got Jesus's genealogy and the birth narrative, etc. And then we have section one, which we have kind of a narrative section where we kind of walk with Jesus. And then we have the first discourse section and the discourse sections are Jesus's teachings uh, where he stands up and kind of proclaims things. Um, and then the narratives are walking along again, you know, following the story. So it goes in this order. These uh, have the chapters with them. And so it's actually a pretty helpful little chart to, you know, print off and fold up and stick in your in your gospel of Matthew. It's actually quite helpful. I, I have that myself. Um, the first discourse is the Sermon on the Mount. The second discourse is the instruction of the Twelve for their mission. The third discourse is uh, the parables of the kingdom. The fourth discourse is the teaching about the church. And the fifth discourse is the teaching about things to come. And so we're going to talk 
we're going to kind of focus this class on the discourses as opposed to the narrative, because as you follow along in the narrative, it's pretty easy to, to see where you're going. Um, the discourses are kind of a more complicated things that, that were happening, that Jesus was saying. Um, identification of Jesus as Messiah. Matthew traces Jesus to David and Abraham from whom the Messiah was to descend. So Matthew has a purpose in his gospel. He is trying to show the Jews that Jesus is indeed the Messiah because they were expecting a Messiah to come in and overthrow the Roman government. And here we have Jesus who's saying, you know, love everybody, turn the other cheek. He allowed himself to be arrested and crucified. Um, he was not the warrior that the Jews were expecting in a Messiah. And so part of Matthew's gospel, the purpose of it is to show people that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. Uh, Matthew recorded two names in the birth narrative to emphasize Jesus's actual birth, Emmanuel, which means God with us, and also Jesus or Joshua. The name means God saves. So Matthew, in just the birth narrative itself, is trying to show that Jesus is indeed the Messiah the Jews have been expecting. And this goes on throughout. Um, Joseph and Mary travel to Bethlehem and Jesus is born there, which is foretold in the Old Testament. We have the special star. We have the visit of the Magi. We have Herod's attempt to find Jesus. I mean, he wouldn't be attempting to find Jesus in, when he was born if he wasn't the Messiah. Um, and then we look to Jesus' baptism, which also marks his identity. Jesus' baptism, uh, it, we'll talk about it in a minute, but it, it marks Jesus as Messiah. And the temptations also mark his identity as Messiah because why would Satan bother tempting him if he wasn't the son of God? So a little bit about Jesus' baptism. Uh, Jesus did not want John. John didn't want Jesus to, ba to be baptized by him. Um, Jesus was sinless, so there was no need to be baptism, baptized. Uh, and Jesus' baptism, as Jesus explained to John, was... Um, it was to fulfill righteousness. Jesus's baptism expressed his self-giving to his father and to others. It was the point at which Jesus said, I'm doing this. Um, he'd been saying that all along, but this was his proclamation, so to speak. Um, his baptism was a sign of the character and action of his entire life. And then we have the temptations. Um, and the first column over here, um, the, the shorter column talks about what, what, how we normally interpret the temptations. And then the right hand side uh, is, is an interesting way that uh, Dr. Blair explained the temptations to us and how he interpreted them. So, I mean, they can be interpreted plenty of ways. But uh, <clears throat> so we, if we look at the temptations, the first one is to turn stones into bread. And that's a temptation to selfish interest. You feed yourself. Feed your, you know, here's some stones. Take care of yourself. Um, the second one is temptation to popularity. It, and this was when Satan says, throw yourself off this pinnacle. And yeah, I mean, if Jesus had gone and thrown himself off the pinnacle, the angels had come and swooped him up to save him. Yeah, people would have seen that and said, wow, this guy's." This guy's somebody to hang out with, and yeah, he would have been really popular. Um, and the third is temptation to power. Uh, Satan says, all you have to do is worship me, and I'll give you the entire world. So those are, those are the ways we usually think of them. Um, Dr. Blair takes it a little bit further and says that the, the first temptation of turning stones into bread struck at his human identity as the son of man, uh, telling, telling Jesus, to fulfill his bodily needs, which there's nothing wrong with that. We all have to eat. But Jesus answers him by saying, you know, we don't live by bread alone, but by doing the will of God. Um, <clears throat> so Jesus shot that one down. The second temptation struck at his divine identity as son of God. Um, basically, 
if he'd have thrown himself off the pinnacle to show Satan that he was indeed God's son um, <clears throat> and he was indeed divine, it uh, it would have tested God, and that that was inappropriate. Jesus knew who he was, and um, he didn't need to prove that. And the third one struck at his mission identity, or as him as Messiah. Uh, just fall down and worship me, Satan says. But but Jesus didn't come to be a king that, that like the Jews kind of thought he was going to be, to rule over them. He didn't want people to be subjected to his reign, so to speak. Jesus wanted to come in a way that was self-giving and loving and not rule over people, but help them to love one another and build relationship with God. The message of the Messiah. <clears throat> this first quote I really like from Dr. Blair um, the five discourse sections of Matthew's gospel all have to do with the reign of God and the meaning of that reign to humanity. <clears throat> In other words, these, these, these are timeless teachings of Jesus um, that, that help us learn how to be in relationship with God and with one another. And just as a note, Matthew uses kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God out of respect for the name of God. You may or may not know this, but back in those days, they never said the name of God. It, it wasn't. They even didn't spell it. Uh, it was Yahweh, and they would just spell Y-W-H. They didn't put in the vowels because then you'd have the name, and that was not something you did back then. And so he uses kingdom of heaven instead. Both of them can be used simultaneously to mean the reign of God. So the Sermon on the Mount. So this is the first discourse section. Uh, Jesus told his hearers what a citizen of God's kingdom is to be and do. Um, the ethical demands, as you guys have read, are extremely high, and they exceed that of the Jewish law, which was kind of the point. It was a little bit of hyperbole. Uh, Jesus defined righteousness primarily in terms of relationship, not in simply keeping the rules. It was it was not so much follow these commandments like the Old Testament. It was think about what you're doing, how are you making people feel, and how is this action loving? The instruction of the twelve. This is the second discourse. Um, the twelve are named here. And then the twelve are sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, a lot of people ask about this. It's in Matthew 10. And uh, they say, well, why were they sent to the Jews first? And we think, for one, the Jews were expecting it. The Jews were expecting this Messiah. It wasn't quite the way they expected it, but they were waiting for this. That's one. Two is that Matthew was indeed writing to a Jewish audience and was trying to show Jesus as Messiah. And so perhaps he put that in um, as kind of a buffer, you know, to kind of say, look, we're, yes, Jesus is for all the nations, but he, you know, he tried you guys first. Um, that's, it's not... Uh, official doctrine or whatever. It's just, an, it's just a thought that scholars have. Um, and then when Jesus is instructing the 12, he warns about how they might be rejected. He even says, you know, you may be, you know, you may be hated by your mother-in-law and your brother and your sister-in-law and your cousin's uncle Charlie. And I mean, you know, you, you're, you're going to be rejected and it's possible that your family will reject you. And Jesus told them not to be afraid, which we hear a lot in these Gospels, don't we? Don't be afraid. Something to think about. Uh, the parables, chapter 13. This is the third major discourse. And um, I feel like we preach a lot on the parables. We hear a lot about the parables. So this is just a nice little uh, breakdown of which, which parables there are um, at this section that the sower, the weeds, the mustard seed, the yeast, the hidden treasure and pearl, and then the net. And so that's just there for your enjoyment. But that's uh, that was the third major discourse for all the parables. The teachings on the church in chapter 18. 
The church, Jesus said, would storm the powers of death to rescue people from life to death. And the church is the manifestation of the reign of God or kingdom of heaven in people's lives. That's a nice quote from Dr. Blair that I like. Um, so that's basically how he summed up the church. And then the fifth and final discourse was the teachings on the things to come. This is the end of age context stuff. Uh, it pointed to the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And then those, those things about no one knows the day or the hour, you know, so be ready, um, be prepared for the end of the age for Jesus is coming again. So that's the fifth major discourse. And then the final events of the Messiah. Um, and this is just a real quick outline of what happened at the end. Religious leaders plotted against him. Jesus shared a last meal with his disciples at which he instituted the Lord's Supper. Jesus predicted Peter's betrayal. Jesus went to Gethsemane and prayed. A large crowd came to arrest Jesus. Jesus was tried before the Sanhedrin. Peter denied Jesus. Judas hanged himself. Jesus was tried before Pilate. Jesus was crucified. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose again. And Jesus commissioned the disciples. And then we're at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. And so a few things for you all to kind of think about um, over the week and after, after you've watched this. Um, a few things to think about is how complete... The story is in Matthew and I want you to be able to compare that with Mark and Luke um, because you'll see when we talk about Mark next week it's it's very different it's very very different and it's it's funny when you ask people what their favorite gospel is uh, after this class you'll be able to kind of read their personality and I, I love to do that so one think think about which is your favorite gospel without knowing all this stuff about about it yet and um, keep that in mind while you're watching these these lessons because uh, it'll it'll actually tell you a little bit about about yourself and your personality and your learning style etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, like I said kind of keep this in mind and uh, feel free to email me sburnham at stgeorgechurch.org if you have any thoughts or questions. I've been getting your emails and I, I really appreciate them. I, I love the fact that you guys are watching and you're engaged. And um, I look forward to seeing you all again next week. God bless you.